Okay, so this is our last topic. We're going to talk about ecology. Now, you guys did ecology way back in grade... Was it nine? Yeah. So, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a few things in ecology. We're going to try to keep this like to the bare minimum in terms of what you need to know. Because we only have about a week and a bit left, right? And then you have your wonderful exam. So I'm going to talk about basically three things. One is going to be involving some math. And we're going to look at uh, how populations grow. Okay. The other one we're going to look at is our like, strategies. You know, like how different organisms go about their business in their environment. What works for one organism might not work for another organism. So, on a, like for example, what works for a lion might not work for a rabbit. Okay, and we'll talk about how different organisms go about being successful in their environment. And the third thing, which is what, what I'm going to start with today, are uh, we're going to talk about relationships because relationships aren't just important to humans; they're important to uh, all organisms. All right. So we talk about uh, some math in terms of population and how they how populations grow. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, strategies, ecological strategies, and we're going to talk about relationships. Those are three big ideas. Okay. Today I'm going to talk about relationships. Now, what is ecology? What is it? You guys studied in grade nine a long time ago. Okay, study of ecosystems, study of organisms in their environment, right? So, what would be example of an organism? You can't think of an organism? Give me an organism. Okay, how about a lion? Where does a lion live? Does a lion live in a forest? Where does a lion live? In the open what? Savannah, okay. So we're going to talk about, we are going to talk about, today we're going to start with relationships, right? Because that's a very important topic when we're talking about organisms and their environment. Because their environment is not just things that are not alive. It's not just about temperature, moisture, space. It's also about the things living in, in that environment, how organisms interact. So we're going to talk about uh, relationships today. That's what I'm going to introduce. And we're going to talk about three types. Intraspecific is within the species. Okay. So how lions behave towards each other. Then we have interspecific, which is how orga uh, organisms interact with other types of organisms. So, trivia question. What happens when lions and the hyenas get together? You've probably all seen Lion King, right? Do they like each other? No. So you've seen the cartoon. They actually hate each other. They'll kill each other if you give them the chance. Why? Why? So it's like humans, right? You already want to understand somebody. You want to understand why Anika is as weird as she is. You need to understand her environment. You need to understand who she's interacting with. Sorry, Nika. I mean, pick on you. Why do lions hate hyenas and vice versa? Obviously, they must be living in the same environment, right? Because if they never came across each other, they probably wouldn't really hate each other as much. And they're also competing for a lot of the what? The same foods, right? So, you know what happens when you put a bunch of people in the same environment for a long period of time and you're always going after the same thing? You tend to kind of hate each other. And then we're going to talk about uh, how organisms interact with their environment. That's a third type of relationship. So let me start with a picture. So one is a relationship of, so let me zoom in here so you can see a little better. So one is about uh, a relationship with the environment, one is with another species, and one is within the same species. So which one's which? Which relationship depicts an organism with its environment. Mm -hmm. 
Which one do you think it is? Well, obviously this one's this one over here. This one over here, the bottom left, is obviously an organism with another type of organism, right? So this is what's called an inter-specific relationship. Do you know what kind of a relationship you think this is? What does it look like to you? Look, it looks like this hideous creature, which is a type of eel, is about to eat this little lowly crustacean. Turns out that's actually not what's happening in this picture. This little crustacean is like your overpaid dentist. Uh, it basically is cleaning the teeth of the eel. It's actually a relationship where they both benefit. So the eel gets a nice teeth cleaning, and the uh, crustacean gets food from whatever is hanging off those teeth. It's kind of nasty, right? Um, this in the top right corner is an example of an organism and its relationship with the environment. This is actually human. You can tell it's human because of the clue here, because of the body temperature, which hovers between, you can see, 36 to 37 and a half, right? So that's us. You can see our body temperature will go up and down depending on the time of day. You can see these are hormones like melatonin, which we never really studied in this class. But here's cortisol levels and growth hormone. You can see they're controlled by the environment. And the environment plays a very important role. That leaves us with this picture. What is going on over here? What is going on in this picture? This is an example of a relationship between members of the same species. This is intraspecific. What do you think is happening here? What do you think is going on here? What do you think that this picture is? So do you think this bird has an issue? And maybe it's just one of those obsessive compulsives that like blue objects. And this bird has just gone around and, and, and collected all these blue objects because it has some sort of a mental illness. What do you think is going on in this picture? What do you think? Was that? Well, this actually is its little love layer. This is a male bowerbird, and what this bird is doing is trying to attract a female by presenting the female with all of these nice little gifts. Okay? So what these birds do is they put up a display on the ground of all these shiny objects. Now this bird tends, I guess, I've seen other examples where it doesn't have to be blue, it could be other colors, right? I guess this bird likes blue. So collected all of these blue shiny objects and is hoping to attract uh, a female. Isn't that cool? Is that your blue car? Like my blue car. This is a very smart bird. I have a blue car and blue is a very good color. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, with ecology, because one of the things we'll talk about, today I'm going to focus on uh, relationships, right? But there's a saying that, you know, there's nothing comes without a cost. Actually, I don't know if that's the saying. But the idea is everything has a cost, right? So what is the cost of doing this? Because every strategy has a, like a benefit, and, but there's also a drawback, right? There's a, a cost associated with something, even though there are benefits associated with it. So obviously the benefit to doing this is you're going to attract a female, right? Which is very good because the name of the game in ecology is to do what? What's the most important goal for every living thing? Is to do what? <clears throat> it's to reproduce. And what we'll talk about in this course is that if you think about that's the game, right? I think of ecology like a game. The game is, how you win the game is, have lots of babies. Okay? Now, there are different ways you can do that. Lions go about doing it one way. Birds do it a different way. Insects do it a totally different way. Tapeworms do it totally differently. Right? 
bacteria do it different. Everyone plays the game a little bit different. And every, every strategy has an advantage and a cost. So this bower bird has a strategy. It wants to have babies with a female bird. So it's doing all of this to attract the female. That's its strategy. What's the cost, though? <clears throat> What's the cost of doing this? And think about what a male peacock bird does. Does a male peacock bird do this? What do they do? They have those really ridiculous tails, right? And they go around dancing. So they, they do something different, a slightly different strategy, but same idea. There's a cost. What's the cost? What do you think? Do you think this bird is hidden? Well, first of all, can the bird be hidden? Can the bird be well cam camouflaged and be able to attract a female at the same time? No, can't, right? So what's the problem then? What, do you, what is this bird doing? It's advertising itself, right? What's the problem with advertising yourself? Well, no, no, it's not a human. There are things out there that would like to, what? Eat it. So the cost is you putting its life in, in danger. Not only that, but think about the amount of energy required to go out and get all of these things. So this is an expensive, what you're seeing here, this strategy is not exactly cheap. It's a very expensive strategy. Big, big, big cost. But obviously big reward, right? Because if you don't do this, then this poor, uh, this poor little male bowerbird will not get a chance to, uh, to reproduce. All right, so let's look at some other examples of uh, relationships. So let's skip down. I'm not going to go in order here. I'm going to skip down to section on. So here's that summary of relationships. All right. So this would be this is intraspecific. So uh, give me uh, give me an example of how lines are set up in their society. You guys know anything about lion society? Who does the hunting in lion society? You guys don't know that? Really? Okay, I got to show you some video. In the lion society, females hunt. So they live in a group called the pride, right? They live in a group. The females do the hunting. And then the males eat first. Don't you love that? Isn't that a great Society? What do you think? Now, is every organism set up the same way? No. What did cheetahs do? Cheetahs are solitary hunters. They're both cats, but they have totally different strategies as to how they go about their business. So how organisms interact with each other, that's intraspecific. How lions interact with hyenas, that's in interspecific. And then we talked about the environment. So let me show you an example of a predator-prey relationship. This is an example of an organism interacting with another organism. That's what we're going to focus on today. Okay? We talked about three relationships. We're going to focus on this one, how one organism interacts with another one. Okay? So we'll talk about today, we'll talk about four types. One is predator-prey. So, do you think they're playing chase or tag? What's going on here? What's going on here? What's that? So that big scary cat is actually going to try to eat that little hair. Isn't that cute? Oh, little hair. Notice that the hair has uh, the same color as the snow, so it's nicely blended in. But unfortunately, the, the lynx has, uh, has spotted it. Now, this is a type of relationship called uh, predator-prey. I'm going to show you some data. I want you to think about what's going on in this graph, okay? This is some uh, data that was collected in the, you can see, it goes back to the 1800s, right? And into the 1900s. And it was based on the amount of fur that was collected 
from the lynx and the hare. So animals that went out and caught these animals for fur were basically giving an indication of how many of these animals there were. For, for instance, if, if you had in that season lots of lynx, lots of these big scary cats, then that would show up when you go out and you look for fur by hunting these animals, right? And getting the fur. Well, if there's a lot of them, you're going to get more fur. So the amount of animals you trapped is an indicator of how many animals there are in the environment. So in seasons where there were very few hair, you're not going to go out and find many of them. So you would have caught very few of them. So this data shows that the populations of the lynx and the hare is A, stable, or B, fluctuates. It fluctuates. And you can see it goes up and it goes down. Now, what would be a reason why it might go up and down? What would be a reason? Why do you think it would go up and down? Now, one of the things that we'll do when we get to the math component of this unit, we'll actually mathematically look at growth rates and, and declines and stuff like that. Okay? But right now, we're just going to qualitatively look at it. But eventually, we'll do the math. Okay, so maybe maybe in certain seasons there's more food available, so the populations can get bigger, and maybe in other seasons there's less food. Now, for the for the hare, obviously they would be eating something totally different than the lynx. The lynx would be eating the hare, right? So if you look at the lynx, take a look at the lynx's population. See how it cycles up and down, cycles up and down. Now. You'll notice, however, that the lynx's population is tied. The pattern is very similar to the hare's pattern, right? You'll notice that when the hare population peaks, the lynx population peaks with it. So you can see it. Peaks, peaks, peaks. But you'll also notice that when the hare population drops, the lynx population drops with it. And that makes sense because what are the lynx eating? They're eating the hare. So if there's not enough of them, then the lynx population drops because they starve. So what happens then? Well, you'll notice that the hare population generally tends to increase first. So you have maybe very few hair in an environment, and very few lynx, okay? The environment has a... Now, here's the thing. When there's very few organisms and lots of space, and enough water, and enough food, because the hair eat vegetation, which regrows every year, unless it's a really bad season, what happens to a population when you have a lot of space, a lot of water, a lot of food and very little predators. What happens to that population? It will grow. It will grow. That makes sense. So when you have enough water, enough food, enough space, no disease, uh, very low predators, the population will grow. And we will talk about that when we get to the, the section on population growth and, and modeling that through some math. Okay? We'll talk about that later. But for now, that makes sense, right? Enough space, enough food, enough water, it will grow. The problem, though, is that the lynx are eating the hare. So as the hare become more successful, the lynx now have more what? More food. So what happens then is that the lynx are catching more rabbits, or sorry, more hare. Hare and rabbits are not exactly the same thing, but they're very similar. They're having more food available, so what happens to them? What happens to their population now that they have more food? They grow. Now the hare have a problem. What's the problem? More predators. In addition to that, because there are a lot of hare, and there's also an increasing population of predators, there's also not enough food for the hare. 
So the hare have two problems. They ru start running out of food, and they also start facing increase in predators. So what happens then? Population crashes. It goes down. And then what happens to the lynx? Their population crashes with them. Then you can see it rebounds. So this is called population cycling because you can see it just goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And the lynx will follow this because the lynx is highly dependent on the hare as a food source. I, uh, you know, we should never be talking about students, right? Right, as, as professionals. But I always remember sometimes you get like some really funny answers and you have to tell, you have to just tell somebody. And I know it's not really the most professional thing in the world to do. So I'm going to tell you guys a story, okay? That's a true, that's a true story. I can't remember the student's name. Even if I did remember the student's name, I wouldn't tell you anyways, but, um, but I, I'll never forget the answer. So I put this graph up on the test. And the question of the test was, explain um, what's going on in this graph. And I'll never forget the answer. The kid wrote, this graph proves that hares can jump higher than dogs. That's what they wrote. So that kind of stunned me for two reasons. One is this graph is not about jumping. And secondly, we didn't talk about dogs. I don't know where dogs came from. Anyway, so this uh, this is an example of a population uh, cycling. Let's look at some other relationships where one organism is not trying to eat another organism. Okay, that's called predation. This, these are examples. So predation is when one organism tries to eat something else. Uh, symbiosis is when one organism lives with another organism, not trying to eat it. Okay. Uh, in symbiosis, at least one of the organism has to benefit. So in this relationship, we're not trying to eat the other organism. Okay. If if one organism tries to eat something else, that's called predation. Okay. So these are the three types. There's commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism. These are relationships. In commensalism, one of them benefits, the other one is not harmed. So an example uh, would be something like this. So here we have trees and we have Spanish moss that's growing over the tree. Now what happens in this relationship is the moss have somewhere to grow. So they, have a, they, they benefit, right? But the tree that is being used as a home for the moss doesn't get harmed. It doesn't benefit. It doesn't get harmed. So that's an example of commensalism. So that would be like what's, so I think your book might refer to it as like a plus uh, zero relationship where one benefits and the other one is there's no benefit, but they're not harmed either. I think the example in your book talks about this, uh, I think it's called a muskox, I can't remember. In the north, it's a very large animal that travels through the snow. And as it travels through the snow, it, cre it creates a path. And the foxes will follow, and as, as this animal travels and clears a path, it will look for little holes in the ground where they can find little rodents. Now in that relationship, so the fox has this relationship with this big mammal. The mammal, the muskox doesn't benefit. Whether the fox is there or not is irrelevant. But the fox benefits. So that would be an example of commensalism. Okay? Where they, one benefits, the other one doesn't. Mutualism is where both organisms benefit. So here we have ants. And here we have these things called aphids, these little green insects. Now, the aphids, what they do is they take, um, so you know, you guys study plants, you know a little bit about plants. You know, plants can move this uh, sugary fluid up to what's called a phloem. 
And these aphids can get into the phloem and they can suck out this sugary fluid. The aphids give some of that food to the ants. And the ants, in turn, protect the aphids. So that's kind of a relationship where both benefit. The aphids get protection, and the ants get food. That's an example of mutualism, where both benefit. You have bacteria that live in your uh, digestive system, and they're there to help you digest things. That's an example of mutualism. You give them some food, and they break down things and give you vitamins in return that you cannot break down. And they give you vitamins that you could use, like vitamin K. So that's an example of mutualism. The most successful strategy, though, is, is this one, parasitism. Now, a parasite is an organism that tries to use another organism. doesn't want to kill it, wants to use it. You may have some friends that you might classify as parasites. Okay? So, here you're seeing uh, an example of a parasite. This is inside the trachea of a honeybee. So the wind, it's, it's like the windpipe, okay, but it's not really, it's not the windpipe. They're like little air tubes in this insect. And you can see these, these, in, these little parasites, basically these little tiny insects, are living inside the honeybee. And it's not, it's, it's harming the honeybee. It doesn't kill them, but it harms them. You guys have heard of tapeworms? Okay, that's a parasite. Malaria, that's a parasite. A parasite, by the way, is not the same as a virus. Parasites are made of eukaryotic cells, whereas paras uh, viruses are not cells, and bacteria are uh, prokaryotic cells. Okay. Here's a really neat example of parasitism. Not all parasites have to be in internal. Okay, like a tapeworm lives inside. You, um, this parasite lives inside the honeybee. The malaria lives inside a human. Some parasites can be external. So, what is unusual about the picture on the right? Was that? How did you know that? Hey, did I talk to you about this already? Oh, yes, I did. Okay, so this is an example. Do you know what this bird's called? It's cuckoo bird. It's cuckoo bird. So this bird, what it does is it... So this is uh, a cuckoo bird. This is a warbler. At some point, what happened is that a cuckoo bird laid an egg in the in this bird's nest, and the cuckoo bird hatched. And the warbler bird assumed it was her own kid, and basically raised it. Now let's think about this for a second. Okay, does the cuckoo bird benefit? Yes, of course it benefits. This cuckoo bird mother. I'm talking about the mother, sorry. Does the cuckoo mother benefit? Yes, because she's getting someone else to raise her child. That's great for her. Sorry? That's it. She lays the egg and she leaves. She leaves. She does not have to spend energy raising this child. She gets someone else to do it. So, does she benefit? Yes. Does the foster parent get harmed? Of course. This foster parent is spending all of its energy and time on raising a child that is genetically not even their same species. So they're basically genetically wasting their time. So of course they're being harmed. So this is an example of, of parasitism. There is one final example, which is it, I've never, I've, I only recently saw this one. So I don't know, I think you might, you can classify it as a fourth, or I guess it would be more like parasitism, but this is a really interesting one. So 
This actually is the, uh, an example of slavery. These red ants have actually enslaved this black ant and has, has taken, has taken this ant and basically into its colony. So I don't know if you want to classify this as a fourth type of symbiotic relationship or if you want to classify it as a parasitism. But what I came across is that it's like, wow, I didn't know ants did this. That's quite, quite weird. Um, okay. Let's end there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some videos on some of these uh, relationships, okay? So let's end there.